Hi, and welcome to Talking Wildfire. Today we're here with David Packham, who is a fire scientist from Australia. And David's going to talk to us about the concept of smoke. And David, can you tell us a short, just a little bit about your background? And then let's get into smoke. Oh, well, my background is that I'm a, uh, uh, an applied chemist by training. I have a master's in applied science. And, and I would prefer to call myself an applied scientist because I dabble in many areas, um, in, including disaster management and uh, uh, fire meteorology. So I know a little bit about a lot of areas and not a great deal about anything in, in specific. But uh, when I through a series of fortunate things that had happened, I found myself uh, being uh, nationally recognised for starting aerial prescribed burning, which I did with a wonderful uh, scientist in West Australia called George Peake. We, we both shared an Order of Australia medal for that work, and that was particularly successful. And uh, I had... I suppose being rewarded with a round the world trip by CSIRO to go and have a look at fire in in the world. And this was in 1969. You know, that was the year that were just uh, that NASA was just about to walk on the moon. <laughs> so it was an exciting time. Uh, John F. Kennedy had 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 pushed the the uh, the science barrow and. Uh, so I found myself in Canada. I found myself sitting on the park that was at the edge of the Rodet, Rodeau, Rodet Canal in Ottawa and thinking, we have solved the bushfire problem in Australia. Well, we had, but only West Australia wanted the solution. <laughs> the Eastern States did not want a solution. And... Uh, I thought, but we have generated uh, some side effects there of uh, this idea of doing copying in industrially uh, at an industrial scale, doing what the indigenous people had done in Australia for sixty odd thousand years, and we had tried it and it worked. So I thought, all right, well, we have solved the problem, but there are side effects. One side effect is what is the environment do effect of putting fire in the very regular once every four or five years into our eucalyptus forests and uh, uh, I didn't want to get involved in that because I'm not a biological I'm a biological troglodyte so I don't really uh, you know, play well in the biological area um, but I thought the other thing that you generate when you do this is an awful lot of smoke and fundamentally people don't like smoke now, I know Australia is being filled with smoking ceremonies now for everything you do before you even have a meal. You're supposed to uh, uh, have a smoking ceremony. Anyway, uh, uh, so I thought, well, smoke is wonderful stuff for chemists because where I was working in CSIRO, in the chemical research laboratories, in the Division of Physical Chemistry, we had access to all the most up-to-date chemical uh, equipment, chemical machinery, chemical systems that were available anywhere in the world. And in fact, we were in front because that's where atomic absorption spectroscopy was developed. And so we had the first atomic absorption spectroscopy uh, devices in the world. Anyway, so away we went and we decided now, we thought about smoke for a while. What is it? How much of it is there? What's in it? Where does it go to? Uh, how does it spread? All these sorts of questions that people need to know if smoke is going to be an issue. So we started work. And uh, I would say that the first thing that we decided we needed was a way of measuring smoke. Now, I had a uh, a childhood fascination for aviation and I got my license as soon as I could and upgraded it till I was 
actually Marthy Ems and, and the instrument rated. So uh, I believe that the aircraft was a very, that, that you can't really study something or, or validate something unless you get into it. And so the best thing for us to do was to get into the smoke, not just look at it from outside or try and model it or anything else. And so to actually get in there and fly in it. But that meant we needed a machine to, uh, to, to uh, uh, measure the smoke. Um, and uh, uh, that's about the background. And, uh, and then uh, in CSRO, we had little groups, and our group was the bushfire group of, of about four people at the time. And what would happen is that the scientist, a individual research scientist, of which we were all, all were, we had one technical assistant or technical officer who was very skilled, and uh, we would each take on a particular uh, aspect, our, our, our project, and everybody else, including my boss, would work for you. And we did this to each other. So uh, uh, I effectively had a very skilled team of people who are mostly superior to myself in the organisation. Uh, and so in we go. Now, <clears throat> one person had been working at, as a ex very clever experimentalist on uh, the theory of cloud seeding, ice nucleation, cloud condensation nuclei, and things like that. So we, and, and, and another person was a uh, biochemist who came to, uh, uh, from the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories, who came to uh, join us because at tea time, we didn't talk about football. <laughs> uh, and so his, his name was Walter Nicholas Kelso King. And I don't know if you know that our top cancer hospital in, uh, in Victoria is known as the uh, uh, Walter and Eliza Institute. Well, that was Nick, Nick King's uh, uncle. <laughs> it was named after. So Nick was a really clever person. Um, and a very funny and interesting fellow who unfortunately has passed away now. Um, so we were in a very powerful position to do some work on smoke. We could get into it. We had a fantastic instrument and engineering capabilities in CSRO there who could build us things to measure things with. And uh, we had the wonderful uh, support from the West Australians who were doing at that stage uh, something like about 10 to 15 percent of their forest area was prescribed burnt each year. So we had lots of fire to play with and uh, and so we got stuck into it. So the first thing was to have an instrument that would measure it and we found that in the literature there was a, a couple of British one was a scientist and one was an Air Force wing commander who during the Second World War had a pretty urgent requirement to be able to measure the turbidity of the atmosphere so that they could uh, know at what range their anti-aircraft guns were going to be uh, useful to them. And they developed a machine which compared the scattering coefficient. The scattering coefficient is terribly simple thing. We have all done it. You have all at some stage shone a torch into an atmosphere and seen the beam. Now, the light that you see from the beam, especially the more smoky the, the sky is, or the uh, night sky is, the brighter the beam. Well, your eye is measuring the scattering coefficient. It is how much light it is scattered by the particles that are in there. And that was a very uh, well, we had to use photomultiplier tubes because the level at which we were operating was very, very uh, uh, sensitive. Uh, and you would calibrate a integrating nephilometer, which measured the light that was scattered all round the beam. Um, and you would calibrate it by knowing the uh, scattering coefficient for molecules, 
uh, the, 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 the molecule that had the least scattering coefficient was hydrogen. We didn't use it because it's too dangerous to, <laughs> to handle. Uh, so we used helium. And helium has got hardly any scattering coefficient. That's effectively our zero point. And the chemical that has got the greatest scattering coefficient is one of the uh, nasty uh, freons, freon 12, in fact. And so that was our high point. Now, so air itself has got a scattering coefficient that when used with a thing called the Koshmider equation, which is, sounds terribly complicated, but it really is very simple, and that is the visual range is equal to the scattering coefficient divided by 3.9. No, sorry, 3.9 divided by the scattering coefficient. And pure air with no particles in it has got a visual range of somewhere around, the, I think, about 160 kilometres. That is very clear air. Down here in Australia, we have access to that because when there's a cold change comes through, the air comes straight from Antarctica and it's probably about the cleanest in the world. Um, so we, uh, we built one of those machines and uh, we put it in an aircraft and we said, right, we're going off to West Australia to start flying through smoke and measuring how much... Uh, how much smoke there was in the very part of the columns. Now, in Western Australia, when you do a prescribed burn, it is almost always, no, it is always uh, inversion limited. Now, in the atmosphere, the atmosphere fundamentally gets cooler as it increases in altitude, except that... Uh, as a result of the cooling overnight from the, from the ground, it actually gets warmer as you go up for a while and then changes over and goes through what's called the inversion layer and then starts getting colder as it goes up. Now, the wonderful thing about the inversion layer is that it keeps all the smoke and the rubbish underneath it. And so you want to make sure that your prescribed burn stays underneath and it is it continually under the inversion it suppresses the convection which keeps the fire a milder well-behaved fire if you penetrate the inversion that's when you start getting the convective things from cumulonimbus or, or pyronimbus um, and that is fires far too intense now i'm sure I'm sure that this was known around the world um, by all the people who'd spent tens of thousands of years learning about fires by living with them. Anyway, so then we found uh, a couple of things. There's a fabulous book which I'll mention by W. Knowles Middleton, who was a Canadian, and he was a, a, a prophet at one of the universities there, and uh, it his book was called Vision Through the Atmosphere. It's everything that you would ever want to know about how far you see and how many, uh, uh, what's the relationship between visual range and visibility. They are different because the visibility requires people's eyes and their perceptions. So there's a visual range is the scattering co as 3.9 divided by the scattering coefficient. So it's totally independent, but it is related. And uh, in a uh, similar sort of fashion, the every significant airport in the world will have a device there that can measure the visibility. They call it the visibility, but it really is the visual range. <laughs> And there is a bit of a relationship between the two. Incidentally, you know, there's always something funny in science. Um, Middleton, W. Knowles Middleton, established this relationship between the scattering coefficient and the visual range by during the Second World War, he, you, he discovered by taking, I think it was 200... Um, uh, women from the Air Force into 
his laboratory, which was a darkened room, and you measured their, uh, the difference between a target on this, a light target, pretty much like an iPad, <laughs> and the background. And when the amount of light between them differed by uh, less than 2%, that, that became invisible. And that is how you measure your visibility outside. So if you're driving along a road and uh, have a look and there's something in a sort of foggy day perhaps, and you can just see the tree further down that is emerging, that is when the background and the tree differ by more than 2%. And, that, and then you can start counting how far that tree is away from you when you first sent it. Then you can uh, <clears throat> take 3.9 and divide it by that uh, visual range and you've got the scattering coefficient. So we had an electronic version where we did this. Now that meant that we could measure it. We could then, uh, Nick King, who I mentioned before, um, did some very simple little mathematics. He was a very good chemist and he decided that there was a relationship between the mass concentration and the carbon dioxide increase from the combustion. And that gave us a capacity to work out how much fuel had been burnt and what percentage of the fuel uh, was turned into smoke. And the answer is for prescribed burning smoke, about 3%. So if you know your fuel concentration on the ground, you can uh, make an estimate of how much smoke you're going to put into the atmosphere. And for West Australian conditions, inversion limited, gentle fires, it's about 3%. If you have very, very dry, very high intensity fires, we had one observation, one measurement on some very, very dry fuels, and it was about a, a tenth of that. They were plantation clearing burns where you push down all the trees and you had windrows and left for a year in our summer to dry out, and they were very, very dry. So <clears throat> that gave a measurement of what everybody knows, that if you put a wet fuel on your uh, campfire, you're going to get a lot of smoke. <laughs> and so uh, we don't have enough information really to say that we can tell how much smoke comes out of every type of fire. Uh, but we do know that uh, from the prescribed burning in our eucalyptus forests, that's about 3%. Now, <clears throat> the next thing was to find out at what, how does it spread? Again, prescribed burning being inversion limited with winds of the modest intensity. Um, we found that the smoke spread out with the help of NASA who gave us, well, one of the astronauts who I was staying with at the time in Houston, um, an Australian astronaut called Chapman. Um, he took me around the Houston um, and said some of these photos might be of interest to you. So NASA had a huge, a huge library of uh, photos taken from space. And one of them showed a lot of fires in Queensland, all spreading out the smoke spreading out to sea. And when I measured the angle for about half a dozen of them, all of them, it was 12 and a half degrees on average. <laughs> and uh, so that started to give us a way of uh, doing a mass balance of smoke from the fire to wherever it went. And one of our fires in Western Australia um, that we worked on we could still detect the smoke well after 100 kilometres away. Uh, we also did the same sort of measurements with, right in the centre of uh, Australia is Mount Isa. Mount Isa is a remote copper area with a big copper refinery at, at that stage. And uh, we 
was, did some measurements on that for an, another part of CSIRO, um, and we could find those sulfur dioxide particles coming out of the plume from the chimneys in this uh, smelter um, up to about uh, three to four hundred kilometres away. The nephilometer is a very powerful tool uh, to uh, play with smoke and to understand it. So then we could write some simple equations that would give people doing a prescribed burn uh, the, the power to predict what the visual range would be down downstream of the plume. One question that hasn't been resolved, but I took a punt on what the figure should be, was at what stage do people get annoyed at smoke in the atmosphere? And uh, because there's all, it's, it's always there. Um, and I used to drive from home to CSRO in Fisherman's Bend around the edge of Port Phillip Bay. It was only a short 10k drive, I suppose, 10 kilometres. And uh, I'd be looking across to the industrial centre of, uh, uh, of Melbourne, <clears throat> where there's a lot of petrol refineries, and, and they used to produce uh, smoky stuff from time to time, and sometimes it would be quite objectionable as you drove along, and sometimes it would be, well, you didn't even notice it, it was there. I decided that I would use the criteria for undesirable smoke to be the same criteria that for the limit to visual aviation called VFR, the visual flight rules, which are pretty universal around the world. And I think it's about 10, well, I know it's about 10 kilometres. If the visual range is less than that, you should be on instruments or you should be instrument rated or uh, have an instrument flight plan. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we need to get that figure a little bit better than my sort of deeming of, of the figure. Um, so that, that really gave a, uh, a technique so that people, and with the 12 and a half degrees, you can choose your burns so that your wind stream isn't going through as it did on one occasion, uh, the Perth International Airport, and uh, on another occasion over the uh, over the the uh, the Premier's Holiday House. <laughs> Those were both their unfortunate trajectories. So um, that was this part of the story on smoke. Now the other parts of it were we wanted to know how what was the composition of it, and of it's a very complex mixture of things. We didn't want to just gather smoke and put it into a mass spectrometer and end up with uh, 300 different chemicals of impronounceable names because that's a great fun for the chemists but not much use to the people in the field. So Nick, Nick King was a fellow who, that was his part of the project. My part of it was the nephilometer and, and, and that area. Uh, and uh, uh, what Nick did, we collected smoke, and it takes a long time flying around in smoke, hours to get a, a fraction of a gram of smoke. There's so little out there. Um, and he did all the work, all the, all the chemistry stuff, dissolving the the smoke in acetone and the things that chemists do. And we concluded that fundamentally and roughly, smoke is one third carbon, that is unburnt bits of the trees and bushes that were down below that went through the process and came out as the black smoke carbon. One third ash, which uh, as the... Uh, uh, as the raw smoke particles uh, oxidize in the air, they're, they're, they're hot 
and what's left is a piece of ash and one third tar. Now the one third tar is really quite interesting because that's the same tar that is carcinogenic in cigarette smokes, in cigarette smoking. Um, there is in minute quantities of it from the sort of smoke you get from bush, from wildfires and and uh, bushfires. But um, if you are a firefighter or fire worker and you're in it every day, it is a thing that you want to avoid. Um, so we don't know enough about it. What we don't know about this is, is there a, uh, a level of tar that is harmless? This is very analogous to the debate that's going on at the moment. Is there a safe level of, of uh, ionizing or nuclear radiation? There are two schools of thought that are fighting each other at the moment. Uh, one says that there is no safe level for radiation. The other lot say this is nonsense because we all are receiving radiation every day. And in fact, it's, we're having a big debate here and uh, it's been pointed out that you get more radiation from eating a banana than you do from living next door to a nuclear power station. <laughs> So, uh, and uh, and possibly uh, the the uh, people on the extreme of there is a safe level um, point out that we might even get to the stage where we need a little bit of radiation to maintain our biodiversity and our health and our genetic variation. Very interesting debate. Now we don't know the answer to that about smoke. But in 1969, in the trip that I was given around the world, I visited a professor of author in uh, St. Something's, a big hospital, St. Hilda's Hospital? No, I can't remember its name, in London. And he was the world expert on the uh, health effects of um, of uh, urban air pollution. He was the first person who said that the, and that came about because the English had had a terrible f fatal air pollution episode in the 1800s, I think, where the smoke from the household fires um, had a mixture of carbon particles and sulfur, sulfur dioxide that really caused massive deaths in London. And so they started to take and, uh, an interest in this and it was he that was uh, in there uh, doing so much work on this smog. Uh, Los Angeles then became terribly interested in it as a result of the uh, motor cars and the uh, nitrogen oxides that were there to disentangle that. Um, now, when you are doing this air pollution work, you have to decide what is safe and what is not safe and when does it become unsafe. And we have adapted around the world pretty much the uh, air pollution levels that uh, turned up out of uh, Los Angeles, out of the uh, Air Pollution Control Laboratory. And we talk about uh, the NOx, the NOx has reached a, a dangerous level. How do we know it's dangerous? Well, it was because the standards are set on the first detectable decrease in performance of Californian athletes. Uh, an athlete was popped into a, uh, uh, a tent and uh, fed such levels of uh, pollutants and when their uh, performance deteriorated, probably on an exercise bike I, I would suppose, that was thought we don't want that level. That was the uh, 
uh, air pollution can stand at level. Now, so I asked Professor Lawther, um, how do you think we are in Australia? And he said, you guys have got no problem at all because your concentrations are so low in bushfires and prescribed burning and they are totally insignificant, especially when you're compared to one person having a cigarette in a lift that you happen to be in. So, but we need to clean that up. We need to do a bit better than, again, uh, uh, just a sort of informed guess as to where the levels are. And my informed guess was about a visual range of about 10 kilometres because that doesn't af affect our aesthetics. So that might be the stage at which it's okay. Um, it could actually be seriously more smoke than that. I hope the error is in the good way, direction and not in the bad way, but by G we need to do some work on that. Um, the other thing was to f find out what size these particles were. And uh, what we found was that the most popular size for a smoke particle from prescribed burning was 0.1 micron. Um, that is very, very small and very hard to trap and you have to use all sorts of uh, techniques to to measure these things. Uh, you're getting down to the limit of what your microscopes can do, so you need electron microscopes. Uh, you need very special filters. Um, and we did it. David MacArthur was the fellow who did it. He was our technical officer um, who had a who had a tendency to like to have to have Rolls Royces, and he had two of them. Uh, they were very old ones in the 1920s. Um, so uh, uh, we had a colourful group. <laughs> he uh, he found, and he was very good at this, because he had also been working on the cloud seeding area and the, the particles, the cloud condensation nuclei are very small indeed and uh, they're well into the 0.01 micron area and by the time you got to one micron particles uh, you didn't have any really bigger than that. That was about limit. So they went from a, from a hundredth of a micron to a micron with one micron in between. Now this turns turns out to be very significant because all the uh, health public health people who are getting grumpy about smoke from prescribed burning or bushfires, and I think from burning domestic wood fires, are basing all their uh, public health conclusions on what's called um, PM 2.5, which is 2.5 microns as the smallest. So they're doing all their uh, public health on a totally shaky and improper foundation. They're, look, they're taking the results from big air pollution things like the, uh, the smoke from burning tires perhaps, uh, oil or uh, some of the industrial processes, and they're saying that the, it, the health effects are the same as prescribed burning smoke. Well, they may be, they may not be, uh, but the, the whole debate is pretty stupid because they're looking at the wrong thing. And uh, uh, this discussion is alive and well. There have been a few medical people who know a lot about public health, perhaps, or medicine, but don't know anything about bushfires. And uh, they have teamed up with some of the people who are saying all fire is wrong and uh, should not take place at all. And the, the forest becomes fireproof if you leave it long enough. Um, this group um, and uh, it's a bit of a mess and our governments don't seem capable of uh, of uh, supporting research that will 
be truly independent. Now, one of the interesting things we had uh, was one of the team uh, had uh, considerable, considerable experimental chemical skills, and he became very interested in the photochemistry that that goes on when you have nitrogen oxides and uh, hydrocarbons in the same area. They do. Uh, form polycyclic um, uh, nitrogen containing molecules which are very likely or almost certainly or are carcinogenic and this is the basis of the Los Angeles air, air pollution because the internal combustion engine produces nitrogen oxides, uh, nitrogen dioxide and nitrous oxide. When they're both together they're called NOx um, and uh, the hydrocarbons are coming out, especially if you don't have a lean burn engine. And uh, once you get those two things mixed, well, we had the same, the same mixture in our bushfire smoke. So we went chasing, or he went, uh, Tony Evans was his name, LF Evans, um, went chasing uh, the ozone and uh, the nitrogen oxides and the hydrogens uh, in the aircraft. Uh, we, we had some pretty good equipment in this little small aircraft. <laughs> uh, and uh, what he found, which was really intriguing, was that, yes, the chemistry was there to generate very uh, generate unpleasant levels of photochemical smog. But it wasn't happening because the thing that was missing was the... U uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, from the sun that is needed to generate the free radicals to cause the reaction between the nitrogen oxides and the hydrocarbons. It wasn't there in the smoke column. Well, this was really intriguing. It can get a bit dark in smoke, but not that dark. <laughs> um, and so we went exploring for it. And we found that right at the top, right at the inversion layer, somewhere about six or seven, to, oh, no, about four or five thousand feet above ground level, there was a layer of only a few hundred feet where the uh, where there was plenty of uh, of reaction between the nitrogen and the hydrogen to produce this uh, polycyclic compounds up there. But what they did too was that they effectively filtered out all the UV radiation. So it was like a, a, a pair of sunglasses up at the top of a um, uh, or um, uh, sunscreen right up at the top. Uh, so again, another very interesting field because by the time you go a hundred kilometers down and the smoke is less, as it spreads out, it becomes uh, less of it, um, is there sufficient? What happens to the uh, sunscreen when you get into those areas? Does that increase or decrease things? An interesting thing that uh, uh, came out of all this was the fact that in the Northern Territory, round Darwin, the, uh, during the dry season, the amount of burning that goes on in the tropical savannas is such that the, um, sort of, I see in one of our papers, uh, a claim that the, if you average the visual range, you come up with a figure of about seven and a half kilometers average, a very smoky sort of, uh, time during the dry season and uh, if you look at the same at the peak of their summertime or dry time in Hobart right at the other end of Australia the UV radiation is very very high and the, the worst place to get sunburn and bad sunburn in Australia is not well is in some of the central desert areas, 
but especially in Hobart. Uh, and in Darwin, it is remarkably low. Uh, and we uh, have a hypothesis, I suppose, it's a bit stronger than that, but not much, um, that uh, the, the, the amount of smoke that they get from the burning in the savannas filters out the UV. So they've got their, their sunscreen by just going outside. So uh, there are all these very interesting little things that pop out of this totally unconstrained research. We, we didn't have to put up proposals for research funding when the proposal says, usually says, well, what do you expect to, you know, what are the results from this research? Because fundamentally, you just don't know what's going to turn up till it turns up and you have to respond very quickly to things that pop off of the side. Another thing that popped off the side of all this smoke work was there was a very, very bad smoke event in North America, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago, when huge fires in uh, Alaska um, and uh, in Canada, possibly in Siberia too at the same time, popped large quantities of smoke over northern USA to the extent that it dropped the temperature by six degrees and so then that started the line of thought well indigenous burning which really has stopped over the last couple of hundred years has that resulted in the earth getting warmer has that resulted in global warming and the answer we believe and uh, are you looking at the uh, meteorological records for that particular burning event and uh, coupling up with the uh, best fire, uh, the best weather forecasting techniques at the time? Uh, the conclusion was that the lack of indigenous burning or uh, historical burning over the last 200 years has caused global warming of about one degree. Um, it's, that would be fun to pursue that too. <laughs> David, thanks for sharing your knowledge of smoke with us today, and we all really appreciate it. Again, thank you. We're doing this for all of you. If you like what we're doing, please give us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. See you next time.